I should leave the United States. It is too expensive. It is too dangerous. If our economy is doing so great, how come everyone is broke? The wealthy are definitely undertaxed. In the grocery store, at the gas pump, on the car lot, prices keep rising. Literally, it feels like everything is going up besides our pay. The American dream is pretty much dead. So it's not completely dead, but it is dead in the way that we knew it growing up. If you take the exact same steps that your parents did to try and achieve the American dream, you're probably not going to get there. The results are going to be very different. And today we're going to talk all about how I think the American dream has died and in what ways it actually is still alive because I think it is still possible but you have to do things differently than what our society is telling you if you want to get there. So we're all familiar with the American dream right? It's this idea that everyone is kind of on a level playing field. If you work really hard in America you can come here and you can buy a house with a white picket fence and a car and two kids and maybe a TV. That was like the 1950s 1960s version of the American dream and it was very possible back then on one income, people were able to buy a house and a car and have kids. And today, you simply could not do that. Humphrey Yang is a finance TikToker and YouTuber, and he made this video that just paints the picture really well of what it was like back then compared to now. So back in 1960, the average U.S. worker made about $5,600 per year, and the median house cost $11,900. That means the home-to-price income ratio back then was 2.1, which means that if you took 2 1.1 years of your full wages and salary, you were able to buy the median house. So back in the 60s, you just had more buying power with your money. Obviously, the salaries were lower at $10,000. The wages relative to the cost of things was much better for the average person. And now they are not. So here's what it looks like today. That $10,000 salary today adjusted for inflation would be $100,000. Let's say you're in California. The average home price here is $790 the median income isn't even a hundred thousand dollars it's actually seventy eight thousand dollars so the buying power for for a home purchase ratio is obviously much worse it's like a 10 to 1 a house costs 10 times your salary and this is not even to mention everything else that has gone up in price. Everybody knows groceries insurance whether health or car insurance gas I've noticed everything that I buy now is 20 to 30% more expensive than it was a few years ago, but I'm not getting paid more. I'm actually making less, but I'm a YouTuber, so it's very up and down. I know for the average person, you're not really getting paid 20 to 30% more. So the wages are not keeping up with inflation and the Federal Reserve doesn't want them to. They've even said they want to keep wage inflation down. It's, it's not that we don't want wage increases. We want strong wage increases, we, we just want them to be at a level that's consistent with 2% inflation. And while 2% is a good goal for inflation, it's not really fair to the average American because in the last four years, inflation was up way more than 2%. You can see back before COVID, it did used to rise about 2% a year, maybe even a little less. Then it jumped to 3.9%, 6%, even 10%. And while it has slowed down to 2%, that doesn't mean the prices have gone down. That means that the inflation has just slowed down a little bit. And in total, since 2019, food prices are now 27% higher than they were. Everything's more expensive, but wages are not going up. So we are really seeing the middle class being squeezed right now in a way that we haven't for a very long time. I know there was a squeeze of the middle class in the 80s. There was a lot of inflation at that time and new economic policies, which we'll get into later. But right now we are seeing a very dramatic squeeze again that we really haven't ever, that I've noticed in my lifetime. Like I've always been aware of inflation inflation being 2% a year, not 10% a year. One year home prices in major cities were up like 20% and they have gone down a bit, but all in all still a lot more expensive and the wages have not caught up. It's interesting to look at what the cost of everything else was like even back in 1960, 1950. So take a look at this. Everything was a lot less expensive, even when we adjust it for inflation. So adjusted for inflation, this is the numbers, you can see that a new house was $174,000. Like you're not buying a new house for $174,000 hardly anywhere in America anymore. The average income estimated for inflation was 69,000. So it was still that two to one buying power ratio. Some of these things are similar to now, like eggs being $4, that is very similar to now. Milk, coffee, why was coffee so expensive back then? But the basic necessities were a lot more affordable. And one thing 
something I really want to hit home here is back in that time, you could do this with a normal job, even a below average job, I'm pretty sure. We're talking factory workers. I found this record of what people made in 1969, and you can see even farm laborers and people that worked in a mine were making for that time what could afford you a middle class life. But today we're finding ourselves in a position where even essential jobs are getting squeezed out of the middle class. There are a ton of jobs that we need people to do, right? Teachers, police officers, firefighters. These kinds of jobs today do not pay enough. Let's take a look at an essential job. I would say a kind of a normal job like that a lot of people have. A firefighter, as an example. A job that we need people to do. Like the average nationally in 2011 was $45,000. 11 years later, we can see the mean annual wage is now $56,000. So in 10 years, the wages have not gone up that much. But meanwhile, in that time, housing prices have essentially doubled in a lot of places. Let's say you're a firefighter in Los Angeles, where I live. So at the high end, you could earn 90 to $100,000 a year. So that is not the average from what I found. That is like a more experienced firefighter. And if you want to buy a starter home in LA, it would be $1.25 million. That would be in the valley, not even in the more central part of LA. Back in 2011, it was only $700,000. But today at 1.25 million, it's almost doubled. It's increased in price significantly to the point that a firefighter would be priced out of buying this house now. And also just, I wanna note, this house looks like it would need major work. It's definitely pretty old. It's probably 80 years old, at least. I'm not even talking aesthetically, I'm talking functionally. It, those older houses, they pretty much always need something. The point I'm making here is the salary for a firefighter has only gone up, what, $11,000, $15,000 on average, but the home prices have almost doubled and homes aren't the only thing that that's happened to. To afford to qualify to buy that house, you would more likely need to make around $200,000 a year. So, you know, dual income, they could get there. But if you have student loans or any other debt, like it would be really hard. What we're seeing is the American dream is dead if you have a normal job, a nine to five job. You can definitely still get by on these jobs as a single person. You'd probably need to have roommates, but when it comes to buying a house, a car, kids, having some extra money. It just, you can't. I just, I don't know how you're gonna get there unless you have generational wealth, which we'll talk about later. I think generational wealth is, is not the American dream though. The whole idea is that you can get there on your own merit, but not, not the case as much anymore. It kind of never was though when you think about it in a lot of cases, but now it's really, really not. I will say if you are dual income working in tech, if you work at Google, Snap, Meta, you're probably doing just fine. And I would consider that a normal job. It's a nine to five. You know, they're getting paid enough to live. And let's not demonize those people. They're getting paid what like everyone else should be, honestly, like good, it's good. But even some above average jobs, like a lawyer or a doctor today, jobs that require a lot of education, I think these are also where the American dream is dead if you don't have generational wealth. And I'm saying that because the amount of debt you have to take on to get one of these very high paying jobs makes it almost a wash now. I'm a doctor married to another doctor and this person says, so y'all have some money. On average, a Caribbean medical student, depending on the school they go to, could be anywhere from $350,000 to $450,000 in debt. After all the interest and stuff, you could do the math. My wife and I are somewhere around a million dollars in medical school debt. People come out of medical school with a debt of around $500,000. You have to take out so much debt to get there that it's almost not worth it. I think in the long run, it still is. You have to take out a lot more than you used to. And the thing is, with a doctor, once you're out of medical school, you're still not making a lot of money. You're making like fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year, maybe a little more now. Thirty thousand. Until you're out of residency, you're not even making that much yet. You're spending 10 years of time where you could be compounding wealth, but you're not. You're compounding interest that you owe. In some specialties, don't actually pay that well. I know a pediatrician on average, they're not making what a surgeon is making. In that case, 
it just, it doesn't really seem worth it. There's a lot of other jobs that would pay $200,000 a year that don't require 10 grueling years of your life and hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt. Same thing with law school. Law school is also very expensive and grueling. You can't really have a job at the same time. So you're getting into so much debt that again, I just don't really think it's that worth it. You might be better off just figuring out a way to make money right out of high school and investing that money right out the gate. Given average salaries, the cost of student loans and that they both start at 18 years old at age 28 the plumber will have a net worth of four hundred and fifty thousand dollars and the doctor negative two hundred and fifty thousand dollars ten years later at 38 the plumber will have 1.6 million dollars and the doctor 1.2 million it's not until the age of 41 does the doctor's net worth finally pass that of the plumbers are you surprised so most jobs even the really good ones it's like just doesn't seem worth it so it seems like okay who is able to afford this all still like what is going on because people are still buying houses who who is buying these houses and i'll tell you what's going on it's people with generational wealth i think it's always kind of been like that but the income inequality that we have now is so much worse than it was before that it makes even more of a difference so people aren't shouting this from the rooftops that's why you don't really see it as much i know people personally and i also know real estate agents have, who have told me this is the case also who when they're going to buy a house their parents gift them the money for the down payment because it's just too expensive now with a normal job you probably know people who this is the case but they're not you know, going and telling everyone. Usually these same people who are gonna get a gift for a down payment probably also didn't have to take out student loans as well. There's a huge advantage there. There have been some studies that have already showed that 54% of millennials that own a home had help from their parents and Gen Z, 80%. You have a huge leg up to buy real estate if your parents are wealthy. I even know people who their parents didn't gift them the money, but they bought the house for them in cash and they had their, their child pay them back and just the fact that they were able to buy it in cash made the offer a lot more competitive to other people who don't have that advantage like if you're not familiar with real estate if you have an all cash offer that's very appealing to sellers and so people with wealthy parents a lot of the time they'll front them the money to buy it in cash or they'll give them the down payment there's just a lot of advantages to having parents with money. To be clear, my parents did not do any of this. I'm just very fortunate that YouTube has worked out. Um, another reason I think that the middle class is dead in, in the normal sense we're thinking about it as is the income inequality is much higher. So take a look at this chart. You can see from the 80s, it used to be when we had a stronger middle class, most of the money was with the bottom 50%. And then we saw that over time just flip. Now, most of the money is with the 1% and the bottom 50% doesn't even have like half of it, it looks like from this graph. So when we look at what happens, like why can people not afford things? This economic inequality is a huge reason because it's kind of just killed the middle class. We really don't have a strong middle class anymore. And a lot of people think they are middle class still when they're not. <laughs> The thing is, though, it is true that Biden would raise taxes a little bit for everyone. But what they don't see is that Trump's tax cuts were actually the highest for corporations, a.k.a. the wealthiest people. Trump's tax cuts for individuals was anywhere from one to four percent. The biggest tax cut was for corporations. They got a 14 percent cut. They were also able to get 100% bonus depreciation for certain things, aka private jets. So people that owned large corporations could claim that they didn't make any money by buying a private jet. <laughs> And a lot of companies do this. It doesn't have to be a private jet. It can actually be a number of different things. But this is how companies like Amazon and Nike end up paying almost nothing in federal taxes. It was also found that Nike has offshore accounts in Bermuda. And the Trump tax cut made it easier to get away with this. A lot of people blame the increased income inequality on Reaganomics. So back in the 80s, when Reagan was president, he did give a lot of tax cuts to the rich. At the time, though, the taxes were 70% as the highest tax rate and he brought it down to 50 percent so we're still a lot lower even than that reagan's economic policy was called supply side economic and the whole idea was that 
it would make industries more productive and efficient and that additional money generated would trickle down to the middle class. But it didn't really trickle down to the middle class because what happens when wealthy people make money is they reinvest it in property, stock buybacks. They're not just going and giving people a raise out of the goodness of their heart a lot of the time. They're just gonna give people like whatever they need to to get them to do the job. Even though we're more productive than ever, we have so much more technology now, most of that wealth accumulated from that goes to the top 1%, it doesn't really end up trickling down all that much. You know how very few companies control entire markets? That's because of Ronald Reagan and the growing wealth gap. He had a hand in that too. During his first year, he instituted across the board tax cuts that mostly benefited corporations and wealthy Americans. That same year in 1981, Reagan altered antitrust laws, almost completely eliminating section two of the Sherman Antitrust Act, which makes it against the law to monopolize or attempt to monopolize any part of trade or commerce. Author David Dang claimed the antitrust theory that began with Reagan has brought us to a period of market concentration unrivaled since the Gilded Age. On top of I'll link that TikTok down below because it really does quickly explain what Reagan did. And the really cool thing is now we have data of how this has affected us. So this is 1950 to 1980, so pre-Reagan. And you can see that wages did grow steadily with GDP growth. And the bottom 90% was growing at a similar rate to the top 10%. And this is during and post-Reagan. As you can see, the top 1% went crazy in the top 0.01% has the greatest share of the wealth. Meanwhile, the bottom 90% has barely any of it. This is when we saw that even though GDP was growing, so companies were still making more money, wages were not going up steadily with that like they were before. So if you're at a job where you're relying on an annual salary, you're not seeing an increase that, you know, that the person that owns the company is seeing ever really not an expert on Reaganomics, but I've watched some videos about it and I would definitely recommend going and checking it out if you're interested in this kind of thing, because a lot of people do point to that as one of the major reasons that we have more income inequality now. So from what I've gathered, this is kind of what killed the middle class and that is how we've gotten here. Another thing that really comes into play is the increased cost of education. Almost every job requires a college degree and it's not cheap to get there. Most people are doing the four year school route and even an average school can be like $30,000 a year for an average state school. I found one example, Washington State University. It is the state school that's in the middle of nowhere. So it should be really cheap to live out there, but for one year, it's $33,000. So four years at this school, you're having to take out a hundred and twenty thousand dollars to go there that just seems crazy but i think the issue is a college degree just doesn't even hold that much weight anymore it seems like it's just a base requirement the way that high school was back in the day so it's not like it's going to get you that much better of a job it's just going to get you a starter job i think what we're seeing now is people are graduating high school going and taking out so much money in student loans that they can't even think about buying a house covid was also a major cause in everything going up in price. So just the jump from 2019 to now alone has been very dramatic. And I think we're reaching the breaking point and that's why we're seeing so many more people talk about it because at what point can people just not afford any of this stuff? There was a lot of inflation during COVID and also a lot of corporate greed. We know now based on earnings calls from companies that they, they said it was inflation when really they were just raising the price because they could. Or maybe it initially was a supply chain issue but then they never lowered the price again. This article found that even if the input cost for the producer only raised 1%, they still rose the price for customers 3 to 4%. And even though now costs have come down, they have not passed on that savings. Like, I feel like every company increased their prices just for the hell of it, just because they could. But we're reaching a breaking point where are these companies even going to make any money because no one's going to be buying anything because Jeff Bezos just has all the money. This has probably been kind of depressing to realize all of this, right? But there is still hope, okay? I think it's important to know all of this though because a lot of people are still planning out their life and going about everything as if we have the advantages that boomers had economically when we do not have that same buying power 
or affordability at all. I think you just cannot achieve the American dream with a normal job that is a W-2 job with a salary, unless maybe you're working in tech or if your parents are rich and you know, they can kind of subsidize your life. But the new American dream, the new way to actually achieve this, it's own your own company, own your own business or leave the US. So let's start with the leaving the US option. I'm not saying that this is what you should do. I'm just saying, I'm seeing a trend of people doing this. I've seen people leave the US to go to Europe and Mexico. Europe is still pretty expensive, but more affordable than the US. There is a finance YouTuber, Rose Hahn. She actually moved to Mexico City and she has a better life there. She really does. She was able to buy a place. Everything is less expensive. Okay, the elephant in the room here though is that this is not a good trend for people that are native to Mexico City. So I'm not saying to do this because I don't think it's sustainable. I see why people do it, but I think in a lot of ways, it's not fair to people that live in Mexico because it's just not gonna increase the cost of living there, but they don't have the benefit of the US salaries that a digital nomad has. So it's kind of not fair. It's like bringing our problems over there. So it is something people are doing though, like for the first time that I've seen because you get more for your money there. And then with Europe, I've actually seen a couple on YouTube that decided to retire there because healthcare was too expensive in America. We left the United States in 2017 and our only regret is not leaving sooner. Europe is pretty expensive still in a lot of places, but CNBC made a video about this girl who bought a home in Italy and is living large there. I paid 62,000 US dollars for this home. All in my renovation costs are 21,000 US dollars. I may go grocery shopping here and spend 60 euro. It's no way I can walk in a Publix in the United States and not spend over hundred dollars. Here we have a whole chicken cut into pieces for two euro. I actually got coffee recently with a British YouTuber who was in LA and she was telling me that she was shocked at how expensive groceries are here because back in the UK, it's like not nearly anything like that. I even noticed this because I've gone to Switzerland two different times, once in 2018 and once last year. I remember in 2018 being shocked at how everything was so expensive. Starbucks there, the food, everything was just so much more expensive than in, in America. And then when I went last year, I was like, these prices are about American prices actually. They're about the same. Some things are cheaper. Skiing is cheaper there. I was just like, it's kind of the same as the most expensive country in the world now. That's crazy. So that's one thing that people are doing. They're leaving the US. It's pretty ironic that now it's easier to achieve the American dream outside of America in a lot of cases. And this is not even to mention people that come here with nothing and have absolutely no advantage. It is, it's so much harder for them. What I'm mostly referring to in this video is people that grew up middle class are having a hard time achieving middle class in adulthood. The second one, like I talked about, owning your own business. I mean, the big issue is wages have stayed stagnant, but if you own your own business, you actually have the opportunity to make a lot of money. I'm not saying it's easy. It's actually really hard. Like most businesses fail, but this is the shot that people have at making a lot of money now. There are a ton of businesses, small businesses, where people make a lot of money. You can be a solopreneur or have a small business and still make a lot more than you would at a nine to five job. You can even leverage your nine to five job into a side hustle that turns into a business that might make more than you ever did at your nine to five job. There's a few examples I've seen of this. Nurses who start their own mobile IV company. When you have your own company and you can charge more, there are nurses who start their own med spas and they end up making a ton of money. Teachers even, I've seen sell their coursework, their lesson plans online to other teachers and that's the way that they've made money. Hey, I'm Allie. I make more money selling my teaching resources online than I do teaching. Or there are teachers who make YouTube videos teaching things. I mean, that's kind of how Ali Abdal got started actually, isn't it? There's a ton of what would be considered blue collar jobs that actually make a lot of money. I know plumbers, when I've gotten a sewer scope, it's like $500 and it does not take more than two hours. You could do multiple of those a day and own your own plumbing business. You might see the statistics of plumbers make this amount per year, but when you own your own plumbing business or general contractor, 
contractors that own their own business, they're actually making a lot of money. I actually recently had to hire a plumber for something that went wrong in my house and the subtotal was $1,700. The cost of the part that I looked up was $500. So they were able to profit $1,178 for something that on average takes two to three hours. I'm not sure how long it took on this because I wasn't in town for it, but I don't, it definitely didn't take more than a day. Based on their troubleshooting rate, it seems like they're charging $300 an hour. The whole real estate industry is somewhere where there's a lot of money to be made. Real estate agents make a ton. Real estate photographers, I mean, $500 package for the photos. I actually met this guy who shoots about three houses a day and has a package that was like $500 to $1,000, sends everything to be edited to a college student. He paid like $20 an hour. He's making, what, at least $1,500 a day doing that if he has that many clients. There are countless ways that you can learn new skills that you can turn into a side hustle that can turn into a new business where you're making more than you ever did at a nine to five. And I know it's not fair that our generation has needs to have like a nine to five and a side hustle to make what our parents could with just a nine to five. I know, but that is the reality. That is how it is now, but there still is opportunity if you're looking for it. I mean, property managers, I, I see it everywhere. I see small businesses where people are killing it. I also just want to note that being in America, you have such an advantage in that anyone can start a business. This is not true for everywhere. There are a lot of places in the world where it's much more complicated to start a business and you can't just start one the way you can in America. You also have an advantage in that most US citizens have more money than other parts of the world. Prime example is with making YouTube videos. When my viewers are in the US, my RPM is closer to $10, but this video where they were mostly in India, I only got 36 cents per 1,000 views. In a nine to five, a lot of times you cap out at a certain point and you don't have to do a nine to five and a side hustle forever. I would say the smart thing to do is use a side hustle as a way to test out what could become your next main business. I think now that's the better way to go after achieving the American dream than to get a lot of jobs, unless it's like in tech. It's not easy and it's not as guaranteed as it was for the boomer generation, because if you're starting your own business, like you don't know for sure if it's going to succeed. That's why I think side hustle to start is good, like in addition to a nine to five. Another thing that needs to be talked about is making your student loan amount as small as possible. I don't know if it's realistic for me to say, just don't go to college because yeah, that worked out for me, but I was already doing YouTube for like six years at the point that I was able to just do that full time. I think more realistically, more people should just consider community college and then finishing at a state school and just finding the way to do it as cheap as possible. Like community colleges are, are really not that expensive. I went to a community college at that time. It was like $3,000 a year, maybe if that. I also did a dual enrollment program in high school. It was literally like $300 a quarter and I graduated with a ton of college credits. So if you're not coming from generational wealth, I would highly recommend doing something like that rather than going the full four-year college route. I know that kind of sucks though because like college seems fun, but is it worth the loans? Like I personally didn't think it was worth it. That's why I didn't do it. At the end of the day, once you're in the workforce, it doesn't really matter that much where you got your degree. If you go to a community college for two years and then transfer to another school, like no one's even gonna know. This is a much cheaper way to do it. That's an easy way to reduce that cost by 50%. That is the new American dream. That is why I think the American dream is dead in the way that we all knew it growing up. I think this is so important to know because if you're going about your life the way that our parents' generation did, you're not gonna be able to afford that stuff probably unless they're helping you out. And so we gotta be realistic about what's going on. It's just like, it feels like a lie now. You're not gonna be able to do it with that normal nine to five job. Everyone, please comment down below your experience. Like what kind of job do you have? Is it enough to cover your expenses? Have you noticed wages stay stagnant? What is your experience these last several years? I'm dying to know. Let's have a discussion in the comments and I will see you guys in the next video. Bye.